In January of the 10 AD year, Tiberius Julius Caesar, the adopted son of Caesar Augustus and heir to Rome's legions, oversaw the formal dedication of the Temple of Concord in the city of Rome. Tiberius had vowed to restore this dilapidated temple on the very first day of his 7 BC consulship, 16 years earlier. This pledge, unfortunately, set in motion a brutal political struggle between his mother, Livia Drusilla, and the descendants of a Cornelian woman named Scribonia Libo. Originally dedicated in 367 BC, the Temple of Concord commemorated the reconciliation of Rome's plebeian and patrician classes, following a century and a half of struggles over plebeian inequality within Roman government. In 121 BC, following the murder of Tribune of the Plebs, Gaius Gracchus, and the political victory of the Patriciate over the rising populist movement led by the brothers Gracchi, the consul Lucius Opimius restored the 250-year-old temple, symbolising Concord's reconciliation, to the then-victorious patricians. So, when Tiberius, a patrician of the Claudian family, vowed to restore the temple in 6 BC, the plebeian classes perceived this as a sign that Roman governance was poised to return to the oligarchic system that had plunged the Republic into 60 years of civil wars. Scribonia Libo was the aunt of Sextus Pompeius, the last surviving son of Pompeius Magnus. Caesar Augustus, the plebeian-turned-patrician grand-nephew of Julius Caesar, sought to solidify his newly adopted heritage within the Julian family by marrying into the patrician class. In negotiations with Sextus Pompeius, whose naval blockade was causing widespread famine and starvation across Italy, Augustus agreed to marry Scribonia Libo, despite her being older than him, and having two children from previous marriages. But the union between Caesar Augustus and Scribonia Libo did not last. As a result of the agreement between Caesar Augustus and Sextus Pompeius, a general amnesty was declared, and an end to the violent prescriptions. This allowed Rome's political refugees, many of whom had sought protection with Sextus Pompeius on the island of Sicily, to return to Rome without fear of persecution. Among those who returned to Rome was Livia Drusilla, the beautiful and pregnant Claudian wife of Tiberius Claudius Nero, and mother to Tiberius. So that he could marry Livia, Caesar Augustus divorced Scribonia Libo on the day she gave birth to his daughter Julia, whom Augustus later forced on Tiberius, as his bride. It was to Julia that the plebs turned when Tiberius vowed to restore the Temple of Concord. She had previously been married to Marcus Vipsanius Agrippa, a plebeian of the highest standing, and she had borne him five children before his death. Julia's eldest sons by Agrippa were formally adopted by their grandfather, Caesar Augustus, and were set to inherit Rome when they came of age. But the people were impatient. When the city's plebs elected Julia's teenage son to the consulship, and Caesar Augustus permitted the election to stand, Tiberius left Rome and journeyed to the island of Rhodes. But before leaving he purchased a statue of Vesta, the goddess of the hearth associated with his mother, Livia Drusilla, and placed it in the dilapidated Temple of Concord, a subtle reminder to his mother not to abandon him. Seven years later, in 2 AD, Tiberius was recalled to Rome, and everything had changed. Not only had his wife, Julia, been exiled in 2 BC, along with her mother, Scribonia Libo, and most of her Cornelian relatives, but Julia's second son had died in Gaul, under mysterious circumstances. A year and a half after Tiberius returned to Rome, Julia's eldest son was next to lose his life, in the east, also under suspicious circumstances. Was it the will of the gods? Or was it the discreet work of his mother that saw Tiberius's patrician family gain the upper hand in the conflict against the descendants of Scribonia Libo? Whatever the cause, 
Tiberius was then formally adopted by his stepfather, Caesar Augustus, who simultaneously adopted his last living grandson, Posthumus Agrippa. Then things worsened. Not only did the Roman plebs prefer the 15-year-old Posthumus Agrippa to the 40-year-old Tiberius, who possessed political, military and diplomatic experience, but it seemed as if even the gods had turned against the Claudians. In 6 AD, as Tiberius was preparing for war against Germania's Marcomanni tribe, rebellion erupted elsewhere, compelling Tiberius to abandon Germania and march his forces into Pannonia. Alongside the Pannonian Revolt, a total solar eclipse took place on March 28th of the 6 AD year, frightening the citizens of Rome, who perceived it as a terrible omen. An earthquake also shook Rome in the same year, accompanied by torrential rains that flooded the city for seven consecutive days. Furthermore, a fire devastated a portion of Rome. By the end of 6 AD, the city was in turmoil. Fearing imminent invasion by the Pannonians and facing famine due to both the war and the closure of maritime shipping lanes for winter, the people of Rome were coming to believe they were under divine judgment. As unrest gripped the city's inhabitants, pamphlets began to circulate in the Forum Romanum, confirming the citizens' worst fears. These pamphlets blamed Caesar Augustus for the recent calamities that had befallen the city by naming Tiberius as his legal heir, while stealing his last grandson's inheritance and his very name. It became increasingly clear that the people of Rome wanted a son of Marcus Agrippa to succeed Caesar Augustus. But Tiberius and his family had a plan. If there was to be an end to the ongoing struggles between the patrician and plebeian factions, the Roman people needed another popular hero to worship a patrician hero. Near the end of the 6 AD year, Tiberius dedicated spoils from the war he and his late brother had earned while campaigning in Germania to the temple of Castor and Pollux. Tiberius made this dedication in his own name and in the name of his late younger brother, Nero Claudius Drusus. While campaigning in Germania in 9 BC, Drusus had fallen from his horse succumbing to gangrene soon after. Tiberius rode swiftly across Germania to reach his brother's military camp, just in time to bid him a final farewell. The Roman people soon began to liken the close bond between Tiberius and his brother with that of Castor and Pollux, the divine brothers whose love transcended death. The sudden loss of Drusus, whose republican sympathies were well known, ignited a flurry of rumours. The Roman people believed that Drusus intended to compel Caesar Augustus to step down from office and restore Roman government to the Senate, a belief that forever solidified Nero Claudius Drusus in the Roman mind as a popular hero and martyr. The dedication of the Temple of Castor and Pollux successfully reminded the Roman people of the love and admiration they held for Tiberius's brother a reminder that worthy icons could be found outside the family of Julia and even within the hearts of the patrician Claudians. Then, in the spring of 7 AD, after the maritime shipping lanes opened and grain from Egypt flowed once more into Italy, Tiberius sponsored lavish gladiatorial games to honour his fallen brother. Germanicus and Claudius, the sons of the late Drusus, attended this grand public spectacle designed to endear the masses to the Claudian cause. They stood in for Tiberius, who was bravely defending Rome's borders from invasion by the Pannonians. As the public's opinion of the Claudians slowly warmed, senatorial investigations revealed that Paulus Aemilius Lepidus and his wife Julilla, the eldest daughter of Julia, were connected to the pamphleting campaign of the previous year. Paulus was executed for treason, and Julilla found herself exiled in 8 AD for adultery, just like her mother. Posthumus Agrippa, who had tried to incite Rome's legions at the Portus Julius, was transported from the town of Sorrentum and placed on the isolated island of Planasia 
echoing the fate of his mother as well. Of the children of Tiberius's ex-wife Julia, only Agrippina remained. She married Germanicus, whom Tiberius adopted as son and heir in 4 AD, and left Rome with her husband immediately following the gladiatorial games honouring Germanicus's biological father. Under the watchful eye of Tiberius, who was supreme commander over the Pannonian War, Agrippina was easily monitored. Marching from location to location as her husband battled against the province's rebelling forces ensured Agrippina didn't follow in the footsteps of her mother, grandmother and siblings by attempting to rouse public support from among the city's plebs. By the spring of 9 AD, all of Pannonia had sued for peace from Tiberius. The two chieftains named Bato, who had taken refuge in the Claudian Mountains, had begun to grow suspicious of one another and of Pannonia's tribes, who had shown themselves willing to sue for peace the previous year. Following a very harsh winter in 8-9 AD that ravaged an already starving and diseased population, and demands that the tribes provide hostages to the two Batos, who meant to hold them against the tribes' continued support of the rebellion, the Pannonian people turned against the rebels and surrendered to Rome. Along with Germanicus and Agrippina, Tiberius returned to Rome as a war hero whose scorched-earth campaign against the Pannonians had prevented the Bellum Batonianum from erupting into a full-scale invasion of Rome. Though isolated brigandage still persisted in the war-torn area, Tiberius Julius Caesar could confidently report to his adopted father that peace was restored to the province. On January 10th of the 10 BC year, marking the 37th anniversary of his stepfather's adoption of the name Augustus, Tiberius formally dedicated the newly restored Temple of Aedes Concordia Augusti. Among its features were four large elephants carved from obsidian, a generous gift from Caesar Augustus himself. The walls were adorned with notable paintings, Liber Pater, the Free Father, by the Athenian artist Nicias and Marcias Bound, painted by Zeuxis of Heraclea, depicting the god of liberty that had once been decorated in the Forum Romanum by the party of Tiberius's wife, and for which she was afterwards accused of prostitution on the rostra. These works of art hinted at Julia's past influence over the temple during Tiberius's exile to Rhodes. But notably, behind the elephants, and hidden amidst other great works of art, stood Vesta, the goddess of the hearth associated with Tiberius's mother, Livia, a silent sentinel, watching over all. Tiberius undertook the new dedication of Concord in his own name, and in the name of his late brother, Nero Claudius Drusus. With the temple's dedication, the long-standing conflict between the Claudians and the descendants of Scribonia Libo finally came to an end. For two decades, ever since Tiberius was compelled to marry Julia, his mother, and hers, had competed for supremacy over the succession plans of the man both women shared. Now it was settled. The patrician Claudians were poised to succeed Caesar Augustus without challenge. However, the peace associated with the Temple of Concord would not endure. Even as the city celebrated, devastating news had already reached Tiberius and Caesar Augustus in Rome. Deep in the heart of Germania, in the thick forest of Teutoburg, a massacre of epic proportions had just taken place, 